Today we're going to be picking up uh, where we left off last time, and I, I didn't intend to uh, speak on the breastplate of righteousness uh, for uh, three messages, but here we are, and we are looking again in our text, if you want to read along with me, in Ephesians chapter 6, and beginning with verse 13, Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, in all circumstances take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flame and darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would enlighten our hearts to this wonderful truth. May we be receptive, may we be willing to do what you've called us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're talking about the breastplate of righteousness and uh, Isaiah 59 and verse 17 says, He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. It may be that as Paul was uh, writing this metaphor of the Christian in complete armor, that he was possibly reminded of what Isaiah wrote concerning the armor of God. Paul knew the, what we call the Old Testament, and he knew it very well. And of course, uh, many scholars believe that he was also drawing a lot of what this metaphor represents uh, from being chained to a Roman soldier during his house imprisonment. But it tells us here to stand there for having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And the last time we were together, uh, in reference to the breastplate of righteousness, we first looked at what it is that we received in Christ when we were born again. And what it is that we have received in Christ the moment a person is born again, the moment the heart is regenerated, is imputed righteousness. Imputed righteousness is the perfect righteousness that God applies to the account of every Christian the moment he or she believes and receives Jesus Christ. And having put on the breastplate of righteousness, we have already been equipped as believers with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And when we understand what imputed righteousness is, then we understand that we cannot put on what God has already clothed us with the moment we received the Lord's salvation. So Paul is not talking here in verse 14 about this imputed righteousness. Today, I want us to see what it is that the Christian is to put on every day. The righteousness that Paul is saying we put on, having put on, is what is called practical righteousness. Practical righteousness. Remember, as already quoted by Tony Evans, I've quoted him several times, there are two sides of righteousness, the being side and the doing side. The being side has everything to do with imputed righteousness. The doing side has everything to do with imputed righteousness. The word righteousness says Chip Ingram <clears throat> in Ephesians 6.14 means uprightness, right living, integrity in one's lifestyle and character. Let me repeat that again. The righteousness that Paul is talking about here in 6.14 means uprightness, right living, integrity in one's lifestyle and 
character. And he goes on to say this, it is a matter of conforming our will to God's will. It is rooted in the objective righteousness that we already possess, the imputed righteousness, in our standing before God through Christ's work. That righteousness cannot be taken away. It is complete because we are in Christ and he is in us. Your imputed righteousness as a Christian can never be taken away from you. Christ has clothed us with his righteousness the moment we were born again. It is ours because Christ is in us. We are in Christ. That can never be taken away. Ingram goes on to say this. <clears throat> But while the righteousness of this verse flows out of that objective reality, this is really the practical application of truth to our lives. In, in other words, the righteousness referred to here <clears throat> is submitting to the Lordship of Christ. And put simply, it's putting into practice what you know is right. In other words, practical righteousness is how you live your life the, from the moment you are born again. We live our life according to the standard of Scripture. We live our life in the newness of life because you've been given new life in Christ. The old is gone, the new has come. We cannot, once we are born again, continue to live in a lifestyle of sin. We can't go back and do the same things we used to do in sin. It, that when we come to Christ, and I think one of the very first things that is a mark of a true Christian is the reality, the realization that you are clean from those sins. You have been forgiven from those sins and you do not want to do those things anymore. That's the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. You see, um, it is putting into practice what we know is right. You know, it always amazes me that uh, for, for some of the things that Christians would do, knowing, knowing what they know the Bible says and teaches, um, we are to do what is right in the eyes of God. Um, we are to, this is where, rather, what we know, the what we know, the being side, the imputed righteousness, comes into play with what we do with what we know. It's, it's all about what we know and what we do with what we know and in the way we live out our lives in Jesus Christ on a daily basis that is. Not just on Sunday morning when you might put on your best clothes, your clean clothes, and you go to church, you put your smile on, and, and how are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing great? Let's just worship the Lord together. No, this is about what you put into motion in your life as being applied from the truth of God's Word each and every day when no one else can see you. <clears throat> this is the breastplate of righteousness. This is what is put on, willing obedience and submission to the Lordship of Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. Living out the righteousness of Christ in our lives, putting into practice what we know is right. Someone has once said, I, I believe it is the late Ed Cole, who was the founder of Men's Network, I believe it was him who said, we don't do, we do wrong simply because we don't do right. And that's the bottom line with it. Um, we are to live in will and obedience and submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Doing what we know God's Word would have us to do because we are to please God. We are now, as Christians, sons of the living God, sons and daughters of the living God. We are not our own. We've been bought with a price. Therefore, we are to live our lives in submission and obedience to Him to be pleasing to Him. Be pleased. And, and, you know, this is an area in which some Christians come into great struggle. Many Christians struggle with it. I think all Christians have struggled with putting into practice what we know is right. However, that's not an excuse. 
although we can all associate with that and understand that and say, yeah, I think we've all been there, that doesn't give us an excuse to continue to do what is wrong and not do what is right in practical righteousness. Because remember, we are representing Jesus Christ. You, the temple of God, we as Christians, the temple of the Holy Spirit, we are representing Jesus Christ. The difference between knowing what is right and putting into practice what is right is all in the doing. D-O-I-N-G. Doing. If as a Christian we do not learn the doing part of it, then we are not putting on the breastplate of righteousness and we will live a defeated, unchanged life. We will live in deception. And you know, so for, for all of us out there, for all who may be out there who are, are saying, you know, I, I want to follow Christ, I want to imitate Christ, I want to be everything that Christ has called me to be, wants me to be, and has planned for me to be, but yet I, I still don't want to give this up and do this or do that. You're living in deception. You are not doing what God's Word tells us we need to be doing. And if there's any time in the history of the world that the church must stand on the truth of God's Word, it's today. It's today in America and around the world. The, the world needs to see the church of Jesus Christ being the church of Jesus Christ, doing what we know is right. You see, our only... Our only fixed point of reference as Christians is the Word of God. Our only fixed point of reference in every area of our lives and everyday living is the Word of the living God. It's not my constitutional rights. It's not the fact that I am an American citizen. It's not because I belong to this church or to that church. It has nothing to do with that. Our fixed point of reference in all things pertaining to this life and godliness is the Word of God. In James 1, 22, very familiar passage of Scripture, says that if we are not doers of the Word, then we fall into the worst type of deception. Self-deception. Self-deception is the worst type of deception. This is a life that is not blessed by God. Now, it would be crazy for me to stand in front of my church and say, how many of you really want God's blessing? And, and only a fool would not raise their hand. And, and to you, I ask you who are listening, do you not want the blessing of God? Of course, all of us want the blessing of God in whatever form that comes. Sometimes it's in joy and sometimes it's in grief that God is working out His will in our life. But the, fact, the, the question is, we all want to live in the blessing of God. But self-deception, self-deception leads us away from the blessing of God if we are not doers of the word, but to be both a hearer of the word and a doer of the word, one who puts into practice what you know is right, what they know is right, he will be blessed in his doing, James 1.25 says. If we are hearers of the word and we are doers of the word, then we will be blessed in our doing. You want the blessing of God? Oh, go to your knees and ask God to open your heart and show you how to live in submission and obedience to Him and do it. Just do it. You don't need a, 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 a six-month course in theology to do the Word of God. And most generally, our doing is spurned from our devotion, our time spent in the Word, our time spent in prayer, and living a life that proclaims Jesus Christ. We don't need to complicate that. We don't need to make that difficult. Doing the Word of God is proclaiming Christ and living a life that reflects that. We are in a warfare. You are in a warfare. You are in a spiritual warfare. It, it may not seem like anything is going on right now in your life that would point to that, but you are in a spiritual warfare. And if you don't think you are, 
And when you go to the Lord, when you begin to apply yourself to this submission and obedience to practical righteousness, you will know you're in a spiritual warfare. And the next thing is to understand that and to recognize the schemes of the enemy. We're in a warfare, we're in a spiritual warfare, therefore practical righteousness is in practice, in practice, allowing the transforming power of God to continually work in you and through you. And that's the only way it can. The sinner can't be obedient to Christ. The sinner can't be submissive to Christ because, number one, they haven't received the Lord's salvation. And number two, they are not filled with the Holy Spirit. You are filled with the Holy Spirit of God the moment you are born again. The moment you are born again. God gives you the Holy Spirit as a seal, as sort of a down payment that you will receive an eternal reward, an inheritance in heaven kept for you, the Bible says in Ephesians 1. You understand that once we are brought to truth, once God's Word has, been, has shed light upon our souls, upon our hearts, and upon our minds, we are accountable to that truth. You're accountable to the truth of God that you hear. You are accountable to the truth of God that we understand. John refers to this as walking in the truth. Walking in the truth. We find that in 2 John verses 4 and in 3 John verses 3 and 4. When, when he says uh, how, how joyous he was to hear that his children was walking in truth, walking in the truth. How pleasing we are to our Heavenly Father to imitate in Christ when His church, collectively and individually, is walking in the truth. Are you walking in the truth of God today? If not, you need to be. You must be. If not, if not as a Christian, you need to repent. You need to go to the Lord and seek His forgiveness because you, you have sinned against God by not putting into practice the practical righteousness that Paul is talking about here. You're not engaging in the warfare. You're, you're, you're setting yourself up for defeat and deception. To not walk in truth once we know the truth is to choose and continue to live in deception, disobedience, which is an unwillingness to submit to the word of truth. So you might ask yourself, is he saying that I'm intentionally sinning? That would be about right. That would be about right. You've got it. You're listening. The word of God says that with the temptation, he offers a way of escape. And when we do not choose the way of escape, of which he has brought to our awareness, then we deliberately sin. And when the word of truth comes to us, we are accountable to that truth. So to not walk in truth, once we know truth, we may not understand its depth, its breadth, and its height, but God will give us the measure of understanding that we need. To not walk in it is, is to choose and to continue to live in disobedience, which is an unwillingness to submit to God's Word. I believe we need to look further further in the heart of an individual who would say that they are followers of Jesus Christ and yet live in such rejection of Him. Number two, to not walk in truth is not to not allow the Holy Spirit to transform and direct your life to live in obedience. You see, I can't and you can't just decide within ourselves, I'm going to be obedient to God today. Well, that's a willingness, certainly. And we need that willingness. But the Holy Spirit in us gives us the strength. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit to be willing and to carry that out. We can't do it on our own. We must bring willing obedience to Him. And with that initiative, it, it, we have been over-initiated, you might say, by God already meeting us. It's kind of what, that's what prevenient grace means. Prevenient grace, in a simple definition, is simply put, I think as A.W. Tozier once said, he said, when you set out to meet God, God was already on his way. 
That's prevenient grace. If you have a mind to serve God, God is already on his way to meet you. God gave you that thought. God gave you that desire. And he wants to empower you to do it. You should never ever say as a Christian, I just can't live in obedience. I just can't live in submission. I'm always failing God. No, you, you are only failing God because you choose to live in obedience. It takes discipline as well. It takes discipline. So in practical righteousness, we bring will and obedience. However, our will and obedience is empowered by the Holy Spirit and the word of truth. I want to talk to you for just a few moments before I close with the words going deeper with God. Going deeper with God. And I have heard Christians say things like, I desire the deeper things of God. I've conversed with others concerning the deeper things of God personally. Almost every Christian you talk to about the deeper things of God want the deeper things of God. Much like the question of God's blessing. If I was to ask everyone who is listening to this, do you want the deeper things of God? Everybody, I'm sure, would say, yes, I want the deeper things of God. Um, there are times when we may understand what the deeper things of God mean. Now, I'm making a connection here to what we're talking about uh, with practical righteousness. There are times when we may understand what the deeper things of God mean. And I also believe there are those who have a misconception of what is meant by the deeper things of God. I was asked a, a, a little while ago, probably a year ago by someone, um, do you desire the deeper things of God? Do you think there are deeper things of God? And, and, and I... I I kind of stand back with questions like that because I don't, I really don't understand where a person is going when they say things like that. And I'll explain why here as we move along. There are some Christians who may have had an emotional experience that had an impact upon their belief and faith in God. So their connection to the deeper things of God may be attached to such an emotional experience. I want you to get that. You know, I, I, was, I was raised in that as well. And I love the, my, my spiritual heritage. I, I love the fact that I was raised in a home that had a tremendous godly influence upon me. And, uh, but there are Christians who, when we, they talk about the deeper things of God, they are connecting it to an emotional experience that they may have had when they came to Christ. And, and it may be that their search for the deeper things of God is connected always to that, that experience. I, I think some would call that chasing the signs and wonders. L let me add here, let me add here though, that experience may be real. There, there may be some aspects of that experience that are real, but, but it is a misconception, and I want you to get this, that there is a misconception on the part of a Christian to pursue God from this perspective of just being emotional and attaching ourselves to that emotional experience. Why? Why is that a misconception? Because the experience then, the experience that you had, may have had, then become, begins to be the dominant motivation and desire over something else that is far, far more important. Pursuing the experience for experience sake is not only a misconception, it is a deception of what it means to know the deeper things of God. There may be times when we are allowed to have such emotional experiences because God is an experiential God. So we don't dismiss emotions or the experience completely, but it has to be kept in perspective. God is an experiential God. And we witness that uh, through such experiences as conviction of sin, guilt of our sin, shame over our sin, and so forth. The Bible says that, that godly sorrow leads to repentance. Worldly sorrow leads to death. 
Godly sorrow and leading to repentance moves upon our heart where we sense the guilt and the shame. We are experiencing God. We are experiencing God in that moment. And now we experience joy, inner joy when realized and assured that our sins are forgiven and we are clean in Jesus Christ. We experience joy. I talked earlier about the reality and awareness of, of uh, such experiences when I began this message that you realize you are clean, you have that sense of being clean and forgiven. That's experiencing God. You see, we can sense these emotions as we experience the power of God because they are connected to one thing. They are connected to one thing and it has everything to do with grace, faith, and the Lord Jesus Christ. These emotions at best, these experiences at best, are secondary. They are secondary. They must be secondary in your life. So the question to address then is, what is meant by the deeper things of God? Do I, am I aligning myself correctly when I mention the deeper things of God? What am I truly desiring when I want the deeper things of God? If it's connected to grace, faith, and Christ, and it's connected to practical righteousness, what is it? What is it that we are... Desire. And I, I came up with five things, and I think those are just a few. I, I haven't exhausted this list. Personally, I believe what, what may be meant by those who say they want the deeper things of God is, number one, a desire within their heart for more of God. For more of God. Number two, to pray more. To study the Bible more. Okay? Now listen to this closely. They may mean that they want a richer experience with God, such as a greater sense and awareness of His indwelling Holy Spirit and His Word, the truth of His Word, working in our lives. Is there anything I've said that you would disagree with? It may be that they mean a more and clear, precise understanding of the Scriptures. Yeah, I think we all want that, don't we? We want more a, a clearer and precise understanding of Scripture, the deeper things of God. It may be that they mean they want to have the ability to be a better witness for Jesus Christ through their lifestyle and testimony to an unsaved and dying world, to be a better witness. And these are just a few things that I've listed. And again, I ask with this list, do you want the deeper things of God? Is there anything in these five things that I have given to you that you would say, no, I don't want those as a Christian. I think we would all say, yes, yes, I want those. I, I have a desire. I want more of God. I, I want to know more of God. I want to pray more. I want to study His Word more. I want a richer experience of God and to have a greater sense of the awareness of His Holy Spirit at work in my life. I want a clear and precise understanding of Scripture. And I want to be a better witness. I just want to be, don't you want those things as a Christian? And if you do, if you do, that's the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit giving you those thoughts, giving you that experience even now. I have some wonderful news for you. I have some wonderful news. If this is what you want in the Lord, you can have, you can have the deeper things of God. You can have those things. The deeper things of God are realized in practical righteousness. righteousness. That is our willing obedience and submission to God's Word. There isn't anything that I've listed that God does not want for His church or His children. He wants you to have those things. He wants us to not only hear the Word, but become doers of the Word. You see, I haven't tricked you by giving you those things. I just, I'm just making you aware of the things that we have received in Christ. He's enabled us to do those things. So when we say we want the deeper things of God, well, that, might, that may sound pious. That may sound um, real religious and spiritual, you know. But are we really living it? Are we really living it? Oh, God's good, good pleasure. God's good pleasure is satisfied 
in our obedience to His commands. Yes, it tells us in Philippians 2.13, For it is God who works in you, for it is... You've got to get this. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. You see, God has given that to you. He's saying, you can do it. I've given you all that you need, and I want you to do it. I want you to, to go deeper. I want you to understand my word. I want you to want more of me. But it's all here, right here. I've given, I've given to you everything you need that pertains to life and godliness, as Peter tells us. God's imputed righteousness is the basis of our Christian life and of our Christian living, says John MacArthur. The breastplate of righteousness that we put on as spiritual armor against the adversary is the practical righteousness of a life lived in obedience to God's Word. Hmm. Let me read to you, and I'll close with this scripture in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning with verse 22. He says, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Are you getting that? Therefore, heaven put away falsehood. Let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor or do an honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as, uh, such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiven one another as God in Christ forgave you. That right there, if you want to go back and read that and spend some time with that is Ephesians 4. Verses 22 to 32. That is putting practical righteousness into doing. Doing. Oh, I pray. I pray that God would encourage your hearts today to not just sit back and let these words become just another message. Just words. Just words. But allow the Holy Spirit to imprint His truth upon your heart. God's preparing us for His eternal kingdom. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Imagine that. God's Holy Spirit dwells within us as Christians. May the Lord richly bless you and keep you. In Jesus' name, amen.